All right, we'll get started. And I want to thank you all for attending uh, this evening's event. Uh, I'm Dr. Eric Schmaltz, as some of you know, professor of history. I'm co-executive di uh, co director for the Northwestern Oklahoma State University Institute for Citizenship Studies, which is part of the uh, Social Sciences Department, and we're hosting this event. My co-executive director is Dr. Aaron Mason, of course, who'll be uh, doing the, uh, the session here. Uh, before we, we begin, just a quick reminder, uh, turn off all the cell phones, smartphones, in case anything's ringing. I made sure I got mine as well. Uh, additionally, uh, I, uh, I have made available for my classes, and, I'm, and uh, maybe Dr. Mason, we can use the same sheets. I have a couple of sign-in sheets for the different classes that some of you may be attending in my semester uh, curriculum. So if you need to get your name in there, do that at the end of the session. We'll put that down. There'll be some... Uh, opportunities for you here at the end of the semester. So they're right up here at the front desk. And we also have additional space if you want to do for Dr. Mason's courses as well. Also, both at the front desk up here, which you can't see, but also at the back desk, we have a couple of tables with materials that are available for you to take a look at. Those include free copies of the U.S. Constitution, and also uh, we have brochures for the Institute to give you an idea of what we do uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, you can have the brochures, you can take your free constitution with you. It's a really nice uh, publication packet. Um, and we have a couple other materials if you're interested in taking a look at at least. One thing also, uh, we do, as you know, have a new website. So that means all the website addresses for a lot of the web pages are different now. That includes our institute. So the emails are the same, but we have to get the new website addresses up. So if you're ever interested in checking it out, uh, you go into the university website and go under the end and the index, and you find the Northwestern Institute for Citizenship Studies. But eventually, we'll get the new brochures out. We just printed off a whole new set just before they changed everything. So, at any rate, just so you know. At any rate, let's get started. On behalf of the Institute and also the Department of Social Sciences here, I want to thank you all for attending this annual Constitution Day 2017. And this also marks, by the way, our 230th anniversary of the Constitutional Convention, right, going back to 1787 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and this year's constitutional topic concerns an interesting uh, American founder, Abraham Baldwin of Georgia, who uh, lived from 1754 to 1807. Just a couple of quick comments uh, before I introduce our speaker. Um, Baldwin's a very interesting figure. He's a convention delegate they signed the U.S. Constitution. Uh, I've learned a tremendous amount about him just in the last 24 hours uh, in, in more recent days with Dr. Mason. We don't tend to know much about him, at least in the general audience, but he really played an important influence on the development of a number of important institutions in the United States in the Republic's earliest days. Uh, one of these contributions concerns his interest in and promotion for uh, higher education. So uh, Dr. Mason, I thought it'd be kind of a nice topic to tie in the Constitution with higher education, since we are all products of that. Um, in fact, uh, Mr. Baldwin uh, was the uh, man instrumental in drafting the charter for the University of Georgia. He became its, I guess, chief executive, which is now the president, the first president of the University of Georgia. It's established back in 1785 and became the first state-supported institution of higher education in the United States. And to help guide us tonight on this topic, we're pleased to welcome uh, to Northwestern Dr. David Curtis Bridges. Um, he serves as president of Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College in Tifton, Georgia. And we will be discussing with him his life, uh, Baldwin's life and contributions uh, regarding the U.S. Constitution and its relationship with higher education. And I think as Dr. Mason put it well, uh, Baldwin's case embodies that very American notion that sometimes it's the lesser known figures who generate great historical achievements. And he's a great man in his own right, but we don't know as much about him, but he's a very, very, very important figure. So this is his night tonight. As for Dr. Bridges, he was born in Cuthbert, Georgia, raised in Parrot, Georgia. And after graduating from high school, he attended Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College, where he earned uh, an associate degree. And then he earned a bachelor and master's degrees from Auburn University in Alabama. While teaching a research fellow at Texas A&M University, he earned a doctorate of philosophy degree. And back in January of 1987, he uh, joined the faculty at the University of Georgia as an assistant professor, where he quickly rose through the ranks to uh, full professorship. 
Uh, in 2001, he was named Assistant Dean of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at the University of Georgia. And then in May of 2006, he was named the 10th President of Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College. And there have been many, many great changes taking place during his tenure there, uh, among which uh, the college has uh, earned its wings as a state college, so a four-year state school. It has an enrollment of 3,400 students, so uh, a lot is happening there uh, as we speak. Dr. Bridges holds many recognitions, honors, and awards, and we're so grateful to have somebody of his caliber here at Northwestern tonight. Noteworthy uh, among those awards are the Texas A&M University Association of Former Students Distinguished Doctoral Research Award, a New Scientist of the Year Award from Sigma, Sigma Chi, which stands as America's leading honorary research fraternity. He has an honorary state farmer's degree from Georgia FFA, he has an honorary American Farmer's Degree from the National FFA. In 2010, he received the Customer Service Awards from both the Chancellor of the University System of Georgia and the Governor of the State of Georgia. The Tifton, uh, Tift County Chamber of Commerce recognized him with its two highest awards, the John Hunt Entrepreneur of the Year Award and the Stafford Award for Distinguished Service to the Community. So really uh, some great list of accomplishments. Dr. Bridges is currently in his 12th year as his college's president, and he is currently, this is interesting, the longest serving of the 28 presidents in the University System, uh, University System of Georgia today. He's also distinguished as the only alumnus of his university ever to have served as its president. Additionally, he served on the board and as a chairman of the board of directors of Ruth's Cottage, a domestic violence shelter that serves five South Georgia counties. Moreover, he has served on the executive board of directors of the Sunbelt Agricultural Exposition since 2002. And with that, I would now like to turn matters over to Dr. Mason, my colleague, the co-executive director, and to Dr. Bridges. And near the end of our session tonight, we'll have kind of a uh, question and answer session uh, involving the audience. So uh, we'll, the first 45 minutes or so will be kind of a conversation between these two gentlemen, and then we'll open things up for you audience members for any questions or comments, and we'll get you out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Schmaltz. Appreciate that. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Let me see if I can hold this about the right. Is that about right? Okay. I'm used to just hollering in class, so. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like this is superfluous and unnecessary, but we'll just follow the amenities and go with it. But thank you all for coming out tonight. And you know, when we think of the founding fathers, we, we, we tend to think of them as members of a, of a single class. Right? We think of them as the founding fathers. And we tend to think of them in a, in a pantheon, right? We tend to think of them as, as existing in this, again, this singular designation. But the more I think about the founders, uh, and I don't think it should be this way, but this is the way it's become, the, the, the fact is they're really kind of in three different categories in terms of how we remember them. There's sort of that upper pantheon, right? There's the, the Zeus and you know, the upper gods, you know, like George Washington and Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, uh, Benjamin Franklin, all of those names appear on the Constitution, right? We know they were there and we don't, we don't even have to we don't have to even uh, discuss anything about them. Everybody knows who they are. Some of those were the Valley Fathers, right? And then you maybe slip into a second tier and you find guys like Patrick Henry, right? Either guys that were at the convention or they were at the ratifying conventions, right? Then you would have figures like George Mason who were both involved at the, uh, the, uh, the convention but maybe perhaps refused to sign but were also somehow involved in the ratifying convention later. So they, that's kind of second tier. We've heard those kind of names. And then, then you fall to the third tier. And you have really famous guys like Jonathan Dayton, William Few, James Wilson, and of course, Abraham Baldwin, right? <laughs> and I say that not at all to be derogatory, but that's the way it is, right? In my mind, the guys in the third class are important and they should be remembered. We don't always think of them in the same light. And so that's kind of what we were hoping to maybe remedy tonight was, was to give you an appreciation for some of those other guys that I just mentioned and quite a few others. 
uh, each of these guys were very gifted and you know, had amazing careers and amazing accomplishments in addition to the Constitution. And Baldwin is just one example of that. So we kind of dedicated this tonight to the unknown founders. Baldwin is just one of those that we could point out. So, but I also want to thank Dr. Ba uh, Dr. Baldwin. <laughs> it would be great if he could be here, but this is the next best thing, right? <laughs> thank Dr. Bridges for coming all the way to us from our good friends down in Abraham Baldwin College in Georgia. So Glad we're welcome here. to be here. Thank you. So why don't we just start out tonight? You want to tell us a little bit about the college? Sure. So can everybody hear me? And, and this is very unusual for me. I, I'm an old teacher. I usually stand up and, and walk around. So sitting in a chair to do an interview is uh, it's not my normal style. But uh, just a little quick thing about our college. Uh, we have a lot of similarities. We're in a rural part of the state. Uh, we were founded, uh, if you'll give the slide, this sort of gives the timeline of our institution. Uh, and, and I think there are a couple of points that I want to make that are relevant to the conversation this evening. Uh, in 1906, the Georgia General Assembly, uh, there was a common, a fairly widespread view of concern about the lack of educational opportunity in rural Georgia. There was a recognition that the, the urban areas were developing and the educational opportunities for young people were great, but in the rural parts of the state there was a lacking of opportunity. And so they passed a bill that uh, allowed for the creation of a co-educational residential high school in each of the 10 congressional districts of the state of Georgia. They provided for a common plan of buildings, they provided a sum of money to help with construction, and they expected a community within each of the 10 districts to provide the land and the rest of the money uh, to open a co-educational, residential, agricultural and mechanical high school. So we started the second district a and High School. Um, very successful, it was very successful, but by the teens, uh, this decision was made that high school educational opportunities, secondary educational opportunities had, had vastly improved, and that maybe what we really needed was uh, an agricultural and mechanical college uh, to focus on agriculture, natural resources, home economics, and those sorts of things. So over the years, we went through a number of name changes, and, and in the late 20s, we became Georgia State College for Men, and we were actually a four-year institution, and then this great thing called the Depression came along, and many small institutions really struggled. And so in 1932, the Georgia General Assembly decided that they would create the University System of Georgia, and there was a big uproar about who would, because it was frankly the saving of educational institutions. Many small institutions knew that either we get into the system and survive, or we're left out and we likely fail. So it was a big, big to do. So uh, the institution that was finally decided uh, would be part of the system. There was a great deal of rancor between the supporters of the then Georgia State College for Men and the University of Georgia, the land grant institution of the state, and even though I spent 20 years at the University of Georgia, I'll tell you, the University of Georgia was not too happy about this institution continuing to exist. They saw them as a competitor and thought it would really be nice if this little small school in the rural part of the state would just go away. But the politics of South Georgia and agriculture prevailed, and uh, the compromise was is that the institution would remain, but it would return to being a two-year institution with a missionary focus on agriculture, forestry, wildlife, and home economics. So that was to me. And believe it or not, your comments about people not knowing Baldwin, this is a guy who never saw any attention. And he got none. Think about it. He, he signed the Constitution. He was formative in the development of the Constitution. He served in the Georgia legislature. He served in Congress. He signed the Constitution. He chartered the first public university in the United States. And nobody in Georgia knew who he was. And so the Board of Regents decided in 1933, when the system was created, that this small agricultural school in the southern part of the state would be named in his honor. And so that's, that's how we got where we are. So 75 years we existed as a two-year institution. And in 2006, we persuade, persuaded the Board of Regents to change our mission to being a state college so that we could offer bachelor's degrees. In uh, to January of 2008, we taught our first up division courses to 41 students in agriculture. 
And this past fall, when we opened the doors of our college, uh, almost 2,100 of our 3,400 students are enrolled in bachelor's degrees. So that's the story. Uh, good old lady knew nothing about us, uh, but we have been the benefactor of uh, his good name. Very, very good. Minor. Very good. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about his background. Uh, just a brief bio in terms of his his birth, uh, uh, where it was located in the military service, and then moving to Georgia. Yeah. Well, so he was born in Connecticut. Uh, his family, uh, the Baldwin family, came from Devonshire, England, uh, to Connecticut uh, in 1639, and uh, his father, Michael Baldwin, was a largely a blacksmith. Uh, some say he farmed to some extent, but he, he was a prominent blacksmith. Uh, married twice, had uh, two groups of kids. Uh, first wife passed away in childbirth. Uh, and so Abraham, or Abe as we'll call him, was, uh, was uh, the third of the kids. And uh, the oldest son. And uh, the father was uh, quite interested and very committed to his kids being educated, which turned out to be a very costly affair for him because between the two, the two wives, he had 12 children. Uh, so uh, his commitment to get them all educated uh, was, was a significant commitment. So uh, somewhere around the age of 12 to 14, they moved from their home to, to, to New Haven so that young Abe could attend Yale College, as it was known at that time. He enrolled at the age of he uh, completed a BA or an AB as it was then called in four years. He, uh, he decided to uh, stay on and do three years of additional study at Yale and advanced through its theology program seminary and was licensed to preach as a congregational minister. He uh, was a tutor at Yale uh, during his time there, which Interestingly, uh, one of the things I've, I've, I've been studying him for quite a few years, but on, only upon this last study did I find out that, interestingly, when he entered Yale College, you know how many faculty members there were at Yale? Everybody won't guess? Three. There were three, including the president. There were president and two full-time faculty members and a cadre of these people called tutors who were in reality members of the Corps of Instruction. They were responsible for teaching the students in their first, second, and third years and advancing them to the point that the students would be worthy of the time of the professors uh, to complete their studies. So Abraham Baldwin had a considerable experience you know, in instruction. And uh, in fact, after his tutorship, they offered him, the president offered him a professorship, which he declined and rather joined the uh, Revolutionary Army as a chaplain. So I stopped with that and he asked me another question. I'll give you a chance to talk. No, he was that, that moves him into a different <laughs> era of his career. And he had a lot of interesting associations in the Army. Um, Correct. Washington, uh, Major Andre. Right. Tell us a little bit about that. Some of the famous personalities he met. Yeah, so he was assigned to Brigadier General Parsons uh, Army, which was under the uh, direction of Washington. So he got to know George Washington personally. He also developed a personal relationship with Nathaniel. What? Awesome. 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 He also developed a personal relationship with Nathaniel Green uh, and, and a variety of other people. Um, and uh, it's interesting that during his time as a chaplain, one of the roles of chaplains uh, was primary role was not to proselytize and evangelize the soldiers, but it was to take care of their emotional needs and counsel them and pray with them and what have you. But the real job of the chaplain was to educate the soldiers. And it's pretty well known that the Connecticut Regiment was among the most reliable in the Revolutionary Army. And it's thought it was because Abraham Baldwin and his colleagues, there were, there were a number of chaplains uh, spent a great deal of time helping educate the soldiers about the cause of the revolution. So they had a deep and abiding commitment to the revolution. It wasn't like, oh, well, we get up this morning, we don't feel like fighting, we'll just sit by the fire today. 
they had a deep and abiding understanding of why this was happening and a commitment. And it made them a reliable army unit. So as Dr. Mason said, he had a couple of interesting things happen. Uh, you know, we've all heard of Benedict Arnold. <laughs> well, he had uh, personal knowledge through John Andre, who was an accomplice of Benedict Arnold's, of the act of treason, the betrayal. And more interestingly, and it was a, some might say, a formative factor throughout the remainder of all his life, that as the army chaplain, he was assigned the duty of uh, last rites and committing the soul of John Andre after he was hanged for treason. And Baldwin had uh, an ongoing conflict about that for many years because he knew Andre and he had inside information. He was there, you know, when these things happened. And he always believed that John Andre was really an honorable man who did what he knew was right, but it was still problematic. And so Baldwin, uh, Baldwin, I mean, you might say grieved uh, over that that experience. But his relationship with, with Washington and Nathaniel Green and whatever served him very well uh, much later uh, in life. So upon conclusion of the war, he's uh, discharged and then he moves to Georgia. Why would he move to Georgia? Yeah. Well, it's kind of humid down there. So yeah. There's yeah. no air conditioning yet. Yeah. Actually, humid. He actually commented in his yeah. memoirs uh, about how tough the summers in Georgia were. He longed for his home state of Connecticut. <laughs> yeah, I, I can appreciate that. But uh, he, he was, at the conclusion of the war, he was once again offered a professorship at Yale, and for the second time declined, and uh, moved to Georgia. And uh, therein lies the first inkling we have of what we, the last 24 hours, uh, coined as the Yale Brotherhood. Uh, I never had a name for it, but. Uh, the governor of Georgia at the time was a fellow by the name of Lyman Hall, who was also a Yale graduate. Uh, there was another Yale graduate from Georgia by the name of John Millage, uh, who had attained some prominence. Nathaniel Green had announced at the end of the Revolutionary War his intention was to move to Georgia. So why these people want to move to Georgia, you might say? Well, the large landowners and the educated people of Georgia at that time were loyalists to the king. And so when the war was over, they somehow disappeared. <laughs> they were kicked out, if you will, or worse. And the state took their lands. So the state was deprived of its educated people and those who had historically been leaders. And, um, and it was a frontier. We don't think of it as a frontier, but Georgia extended all the way to the Mississippi River. And it, it was the most unsettled part you know, of the colonies. So uh, Nathaniel Green had already said, I'm going to Georgia. Now, Nathaniel was a thrill seeker. He was going there for seeking the thrill of the frontier. Uh, but Baldwin uh, was persuaded by the Georgia governor, Lyon Hall, to join Nathaniel Green and come to Georgia. He was also encouraged uh, by uh, the then president of Yale, Stiles, Ezra Stiles, who was a friend of these guys in Georgia. So here was the what we've begun to call the, the Yale Brotherhood. And uh, although it's not really clear, because Baldwin was not really a self-appointed person. He, did, he didn't speak a lot. He worked as a committeeman, as a statesman. He didn't seek attention. And But we think, and many scholars believe, that he moved to Georgia because he was well educated and he was connected and he was clearly interested in being a public servant in the political life. And the view is, is that he knew that if he stayed in Connecticut or New York or Pennsylvania, he would have to keep, he would have to compete with these A-listers that you named a while ago. But if he went to Georgia, he would be able to ascend quickly and have impact, which is what he wanted. So we think that's why he went to Georgia. So Connecticut off the Savannah. So he goes to Georgia, he shows up, and then he has this rapid rise to prominence there. 
can yeah, touch yeah. upon that. But it took almost 30 years to get to where we are. You know, a lot happened in that Graham Baldwin's life, but it took 30 years to happen. And we go to the next slide, which really is just remarkable what happens in a period of just about two years. So we don't know exactly when he arrived in Savannah, but it was probably August or September of 1783. He went from there to Augusta, which we're not sure when he did that, but that was an easy passage up the Savannah River. It's really the only place in Georgia he could go from Savannah without getting on horseback. So he goes to Augusta, and he decides he's going to practice law. Now, I left out that while he was in the Army as a chaplain, you know, he, you know lots of time, he ministered to the soldiers during the day, and at night, he says, until exhaustion is the way he put it, he read French, studied Latin, and studied law, and he passed the bar in Connecticut. So he goes to Georgia, and he decides he's going to practice law. But there was this little strange rule in Georgia at the time. If you were not born in Georgia, you couldn't be a lawyer in Georgia without the approval of the Georgia legislature. Now remember, Yale Brotherhood, Lyman Hall was governor of Georgia. And others from Yale backgrounds were in the legislature. So, you know, he arrives there in the fall, and uh, he, you know, January, three months later, he's the first person to be, the first Yankee to be admitted to the bar in Georgia. And then things just blew up. So we had this governor, Lyman Hall, who had this idea of creating an educational institution, a university. He didn't really know how to go about it, didn't know what he wanted to do. He didn't believe that's what he brought Baldwin and Georgia to do. So he created this committee called, interestingly, the Committee for Trustees of the Contemplate University. How do you like that? I understand Alba has a Contemplate Steakhouse going. <laughs> so Lyman Hall didn't really know what he didn't really want, didn't know what he wanted to do. He just knew he wanted some kind of university, and he didn't know what to call it. So they literally called the committee the trustees of the Contemplate University. Well, within 30 days, Baldwin had drafted charter and convinced the legislature to pass it, and they did. So that happened. It's unbelievable. In February. So then there was another little peculiar rule that you couldn't serve in the legislature unless you owned land. Well, I didn't own any land. He just moved there a few months ago. But you remember there was all this land that had been taken up from the loyalists? And so in October, the state, the legislature, gave him 200 acres of land. And immediately thereafter, the people of Wilkes County, where he was given the land, elected him to the legislature. So he, he rose very quickly. And as you see, he goes through and uh, you know, he, he gets the thing chartered. He gets the school chartered. I got it out of date. I got it a year off. He got it chartered. He, uh, he gets a copyright bill passed, one of the first four states in the union to have a copyright law to protect the intellectual property interest of the learned people. And then he gets elected to the Constitutional Convention. All this happens in just a really short period of just kind of really a remarkable uh, progression for, for, for him. I think it's really interesting, just get your comment on this, that here he was, the graduate of a private uh, and very religious school at that time, Yale, and that he felt like there should be a public university. Uh, and we talked about this, if you could just mention the, um, the fight that he had with Lyman Hall regarding the role that religion should play in this new college. Yeah. So Governor Lyman Hall, who was a fellow Yale graduate, he wanted a public institution, but he wanted it to be a public seminary. He wanted it to be a school of theology. And uh, we may talk about this if we have time later, but there were, there were two things that, that personally Baldwin was never able to separate. They were inextricable issues to him. That the, the advancement of society and culture and young people development of young people was tied to simultaneously exposure to religion and education. And he personally thought the two should be tied together, 
But he also recognized that the, that the country was founded fundamentally out of a desire to have the right to free religious expression. And so even though he personally thought that the two were inextricable, he couldn't go that route. And so he battled a bit with Governor Hall and persuaded Hall that yes, religious studies could be part of the university and should be part of the university, but that it should not be the defining element. It should be about education and religious education being part of that. This, when we talk about the development of education too and public education, I find that his approach is better than Jefferson, because Jefferson being kind of the founder of UVA in Virginia in 1819, people think about Virginia being the first state university, it's really Georgia. And, and Jefferson, when he set up the University of Virginia, he explicitly said, kind of reflecting this anti-clerical, anti-organized religion perspective, he says he wanted no religion taught there, none whatsoever. He said, you want religion, go to a, go to a you know, a parochial school, go to that. But I think, I think Baldwin's approach was more American, more balanced, because he recognized the need for uh, no coercion, but also the necessity that this played in a lot of people's lives. And he wasn't going to, to exclude that. So I just think that's an interesting, we talk about the development of, of public ed in the country, these personalities play a role. And uh, you know, Jefferson's, was, his view was quite different obviously than Baldwin's was. Okay, so he, uh, he, he serves as the first uh, chief officer of the university. It's technically chartered in 1785, two years prior to the Constitution being written. That's something you all should be pretty proud of, I would say. Uh, and then, of course, the college doesn't actually start in Rolling Stoops until 1801, right? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, so, uh, so putting it on paper and charter, it proved to be a lot easier task than actually starting it. And uh, the state allocated some 40,000 acres of land to be sold to provide the resources to start the university. But it was just a little problem. Uh, you know, in 1785, we were giving away all this land that we had taken from the loyalists. So who wants to buy land when you can get it for free? So, you know, the 40,000 acres of land that the state had provided to provide resources to start the university didn't have much market value when you give it land away. That was one problem. The other problem was is that uh, it was kind of a wildcat cowboy state. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of educated people there. Uh, there were farmers, timbermen, you know, et cetera, settlers, if you will. Not a whole lot of educated people. A lot of very common people who looked with a sort of an askance eye at these folks for two reasons. First of all, they were, they were educated people. You know, they were those academics. Uh, but second of all, they were Yankees. Uh, and so, you know, the idea that you're going to start a public education system here, you're going to tax us to pay for it, and it's going to be run by a bunch of Yankees, yeah, you know, it was just, there were some problems. So, interestingly, during uh, Baldwin's tenure as the CEO, he had other things to do. He was in the legislature, he was working on the Constitution, you know, he was kind of a busy guy. The University of Georgia never admitted a student during the time he was the chief executive. It, it, never, it never opened. But, here comes again the, uh, the Yale Brotherhood. There was this uh, young fellow who had been at Yale who uh, Baldwin had tutored. And uh, his name was Josiah Meggs. And Lyman Hall knew him as well. And his good friend, the president of uh, Yale, uh, Ezra Stiles, knew him as well. And so Baldwin recruited Josiah Meggs uh, to come to Georgia be the first real president of the University of Georgia, and he persuaded his friend John Millage, who also had a Yale tie, uh, to give 600 acres of land in what is now Clark County. Uh, the town at the time was not called Athens, it was called Franklin, uh, to create the Franklin College. And uh, so Millage Avenue runs right down through the middle of what is now Athens. And, uh, so that's, that's kind of how it came. So then he uh, leaves his mark that way, and then of course he serves in the Georgia legislature, uh, also is elected to the House and Senate, U.S. House and Senate, serves as president pro tem of the Senate. Let's talk a little bit about his uh, role as a delegate at the Constitutional Convention. Uh, his, his major accomplishment, of course, was being involved with the uh, question over 
uh, representation. He played a pretty important role in that. Let's talk a little bit about that. So uh, he, there were four people sent to the Constitution Convention in Georgia. Uh, one of them played such a little in, 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 in significant role that we really don't know much about. Uh, William Few actually played a very significant role, but he wasn't present on the day of maybe what might have been the most important day of the convention. Um, so, you know, it rocked through and it come down to, you know, how do we decide representation? And there was this uh, division, as there is, I believe, still today. There's one side of the aisle and the other. And it was, this time, it was not Republicans and Democrats. It was big states and the little states. And uh, it's interesting because from a population standpoint, Georgia really wasn't a big state. It was a big state. It was the biggest state among the colonies, but it really wasn't a big state in terms of population. But there was this dispute. And of course, the big states, meaning those that had the most population, wanted representation based on population. And uh, the states that were, quote unquote, branded little states, small states, eh, well, said not so much. Wait a minute, we're going to get left out. We're not going to have power and representation. So that became a very divisive issue. And many, it's been written by many that, in fact, some did pack up and go home. They said, this is it. We, we will never come to an agreement uh, on how to deal with representation. And so on July 1st, one of the Georgia representatives to the convention uh, in Houston declared publicly that he would vote with the large states. Now, Baldwin had been a large state sympathizer all the way through. And so everybody thinks, oh, the large states have it. Well, you know, the small states, we're going to have no part of this. We'll leave. We, we'll never become part of the union. We're not going to do this. And so, so Houston makes this announcement. Baldwin finds out that few is not going to be there the next day on the second and so it will only be him in houston and so the way the vote takes place every day when they vote is they start up in massachusetts and they move south so georgia always votes last so everybody assumed that no state would dare split their vote you know one representative wouldn't vote one way and another vote the other way so we get to georgia and it's an equal vote and Houston votes with the big states. And people literally, I can imagine, you know, grabbed their briefcases and said, well, that's it, we're leaving. And Ball would be a very thoughtful person said, hey, you know what, I can tie this thing up. So he votes with small states. And there's a tie. And many people thought, well, that's it. But it happened, remember, on the 2nd of July. So what were people focused on on the 2nd after the 2nd of July, celebrating Independence Day. So this grand committee was formed and in fact worked on the 3rd and 4th of July and by the 5th had come up with the compromise to have a bicameral uh, body with the House with population representation and Senate. And that, that's such an important part of the Constitution balance and majority minority rights. It's, it's the heart of Madisonian democracy. Without it, it wouldn't have survived. The country wouldn't have survived. Uh, the whole thing would have just gone down. So if he was going to do anything important, that was a good time to step in and yeah. do some of those leaderships. And there were people who questioned him and were critical of it. So why did you do this? And he said, well, you know, his answer was, well, we, well they thought that you know, you're a big state guy. You turned your back on the big states. And his answer was, no. I turned my face to the nation. I did what needed to be done for the whole. And to throw it into committee was the way to save it. And so that, that was the way he looked at it. He, he said something else interesting about that he was, uh, uh, even though he didn't seek a lot of attention, he didn't do anything to uh, ingratiate himself at the public expense, but that he 
he oftentimes even fought against pay raises for members of Congress, and he wasn't too popular for that among members of Congress. Yeah, yeah. So he was a guy that was actually interested in the public good, not his own good. Yeah, and if you, if you read others' writings about him, he was an almost universally well-liked person. Uh, very thoughtful, uh, very strategic thinker, uh, a real statesman, a compromiser, you know, those sorts of things. But there were a few things that he just would not, he was just very principled about. And one was he felt that the members of Congress were there to be public servants and that they should only receive compensation that was absolutely necessary for them to do their job. They were not there to make a living on the back of the people. And so one of the things, the, one of the only few things that members of Congress ever found fault with him was is that every time they tried to raise their own pay, he would vote against it and would lobby against it. And he wasn't too particularly liked in the Senate uh, for the fact that he, he held up increases in pay for U.S. Senate. Did, did you still have the book that we read the quote from? Okay, while you're finding that quote, uh, I thought this quote uh, was really instrumental in kind of summing up his view on, on how education has to be conceptualized and, and exercised. So if you have that, we'll oh, refer God, to God. it. It's a rather lengthy it's quote. A little bit lengthy. We're not going to commit it to memory here tonight. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I have committed it. <laughs> I've read it lots of times. And uh, but it's, I think I really could have worked with this guy. Because uh, it just contains so much. It's, 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 a, it's a huge statement. you, you got to remember, this was, a, this was written in 1785. And this was his introductory, or his introductory remarks when he presented the legislature of Georgia with the proposed charter for the, for the first public higher education institution in the country. So I read, and this is all a direct quote. As it is the distinguishing happiness of free governments that civil order should be the result of choice and not necessity, and the common wishes of the people become the laws of the land, their public prosperity and even their existence very much depends upon suitably forming the minds and morals of their citizens. When the minds of the people in general are viciously disposed and unprincipled and their conduct disorderly, a free government will be attended with greater confusion and with perils more horrid than the wild, uncultivated state of nature. It can only be happy, meaning government and society, it can only be happy where the public principles and opinions are properly directed and the manners regulated. This is an influence beyond the stretch of the law and punishments and can be claimed only by two things, religion and education. It should therefore be among the first objects of those who wish well to the national prosperity to encourage and support the principles of religion and morality and early to place the youth under the forming hand of society that by instruction that be molded to love the virtue of good and order. This part's rather interesting. Quote, sending them abroad to other countries for their education will not answer these purposes. It is too humiliating an acknowledgement of the ignorance or inferiority of our own people and will always be the cause of so great foreign attachment that upon principles of policy it is not admissible. This country in the times of our common danger and distress found such security in the principles and the ability which wise regulations had before established in the minds of our country that our present happiness joined to pleasing prospects should conspire to make us feel ourselves under the strongest obligation to form the youth, the rising hope of our land, to render the like glorious and essential services to our country. And that was presented and the bill passed unanimously. It's a pretty uh, broad, encompassing statement, but he's talking about the idea that religion, or that, that public morality is an integral part of public education as far as he was concerned. 
there's different views on that, but I think it's important, interesting to look at someone who actually drafted the Constitution, who found that, that those principles are not in conflict, rather they are, they are mutual, they complement each other. Again, there was different perspectives, to be fair, Jefferson had a different perspective. He didn't really want to see an extensive uh, role for religion, but it depended on who you asked. But I just find it interesting, and of course, Jefferson didn't have anything to do with the draft of the Constitution. I'm talking about the difference between founders and framers, and there's quite a difference. Jefferson is a founder, but he's not a framer. So he's, in, he's, not, even on the, he's not even in North America when the Constitution's written. He's, um, whatever he was doing in France, he was doing it well, I'm sure. So. <laughs> well, and, As he always did. And yeah. interestingly, even though Baldwin always tied education and religion together, he never specified his religious preference, ever. Now, there's no record that he ever actually took a church of any formed denomination. He was a deli deeply religious person. He, he obviously uh, aspired to and, and held to some of the tenets of Puritanism, but he also held to a number of the tenets of the Congregationalist Church. Uh, he was a firm, a very firm believer in priesthood, priesthood of believers, uh, but he never took a position with with respect to which religion. He just said religion. Uh, many have tried to say, well, it was Protestant, it was what have you, it was what have you. I'll give you a little example of why, where I think he demonstrated his broad view, cosmopolitan view, as you stated it, a big world view. There was a time prior to this when in the legislature of Georgia, only by law, only Protestants could serve. Catholics and Jews could not serve in the legislature of Georgia. And while he was a member, someone raised the prospect that we might ought to consider fixing this. Because we have all of these Jewish men in Georgia that we're doing business with. And we shouldn't offend them. Now nah, the Catholics, maybe not so much. We don't believe them, but we need these Jewish people. And Baldwin stood up and said, no, 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 no. You've got it all wrong. It's not about what their faith is. It's not about whether they have money and we can make money with them or not. It's about, in the term today, is being inclusive. Uh, we, we need to provide opportunity. Remember, we created this great country on the premise that we have religious freedom. How can we now create a government that excludes certain people from participating? And so on several occasions, he, uh, he did his thing with respect to education and religion. He always spoke favorably of the two being done together, but he didn't, he didn't want to force it. It's very similar to what Washington says in his farewell address, that he says religion and morality are the indispensable supports of government. The, the, they were thinking the same way. So, just to cap, to end cap here for our discussion tonight. What's um, what's something that you've learned about Baldwin that you've tried to uh, incorporate in your tenure at the university there, uh, or your career in higher ed? Are there any principles that you think are guiding that way for Baldwin? Well, I, I have this. Uh, I grew up in a very rural part of the, very rural part of the state. Uh, Alva is a large city compared to the town that I grew up in of 88 people. Uh, there were 16 people in my high school graduating class. Uh, so I, I understand rural America, rural, and, and, and education. I believe, I believe, you know, uh, education is is absolutely essential uh, for the improvement of not only your individual life, but our collective life in society. So a couple of things that we've done at Abraham Ball and Agricultural College, uh, I, I'm a firm believer in if your message is not getting out, simplify your message. I believe in a very simple message. If you, if you can't state your mission, if every faculty member and staff member of our institution cannot, on the sidewalk when confronted, state what our mission is, I know, this goes against great. Most educational institutions have mission statements about this long. You read it, you don't have a clue what it says. So when I came in, I said, well, we need to have some mission statements because if we can't recite it, then we can't do it. So we've done that. And, and our mission statement, you go to our website, it's very simple. Our, our job is to coach, mentor, engage, teach, 
and otherwise provide young people the tools that will prepare them to be contributing, positively contributing members of the communities in which they choose to live and work. That's it. That's our mission statement. And all learning does occur in the classroom. We know that. Some learning occurs with individual uh, mentoring, coaching, and tutoring. And we do have to, uh, to, to raise our people up. Um, wisdom does come with age. Uh, and, and part of the educational process is exposing students to experiences that grow them not only in knowledge, but grow them in wisdom. And so one of the things that we advocate, I say it every year at convocation, and I say it every semester at graduation, I remind the graduates. And some of my faculty and staff after 12 years have got a time of hearing it. Uh, but I believe firmly that college students must, every student must be given the opportunity to serve and to be served. Think about it. You gotta learn to do both. You gotta learn to lead, but there are also times when you must follow. And the most important one, which doesn't go over well these days, is you must be given the opportunity to succeed, but you also must be given the opportunity, in fact, I believe it is a requirement that at some point in process through your college career, you must absolutely fail. Now, that doesn't mean you have to fail a class, okay? Don't give me, I didn't say it's okay to make Fs. I didn't say get Ds, get degrees. I'm talking about smaller things. But I, I really believe that we have to challenge our students and give them the opportunity to be very successful. But give them the humbling experience and the humility that comes with failure. And I think Baldwin, Baldwin aspired a lot of that. And then one of the other things that I think, can you expect this from me? I, I, I'm an agriculturalist and engineer by training, largely an agriculturalist. But Baldwin wanted the University of Georgia to be situated on a large piece of property because he said that he wanted students to not just learn the books, the great books, and learn the philosophy, but he wanted them to have time to experience nature, dabble in the art of gardening, which is what he called it, the art of gardening, and, and make observation of nature and things of that sort. And why did he say that? Not that he said it, it was what, what, what was important to me and has become even more important in my elder years as a president. He said, it is because if we give students these opportunities, they will invest their time in things that are meaningful as opposed to getting in trouble and investing their time in folly. It's almost biblical. You know, it's about invest your time in uh, not in folly. I mean, you can see it in Baldwin's, uh, you can see it in Baldwin's encouragement. So, I, you know, I think we, uh, we, it's not about degrees. I, I'm a firm believer in that. A college degree is just a piece of paper. It's the experience that comes along with it that prepares you for life and a life, you know, a life of learning. And uh, so I hope students will do that. Uh, you know, I for, sometimes get myself in trouble because I tell people I don't want to focus on what the student's major is. I want to focus on what the student wants to do the rest of their life. And let's help prepare the student to do whatever that is. And, and they may not even understand the right major. They just may know, hey, you know, I could, I could be happy and productive doing this. And part of our job is to help them get there, whatever the requirement is to get there. Good. Okay, great. Let's, have, uh, let's open up to Q&A now. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Bridges? You, you said they gave him 200 acres of land. Did he ever become a slaveholder or a farmer? Okay, great question. Um, so, I'm going to stand up for a minute. Um, you can probably hear me, right? Can you hear me? Yes. I'm a wandering lecturer and preacher. I don't do very well on goddamn. So, okay, so the question was, he ever a farmer? He did enjoy gardening, but frankly, it appears to me, based on his record of accomplishment, the guy could not possibly have had many daylight hours in which to have gardened or farmed. He never farmed. We know he never farmed. The 200 acres that were given to him by the Georgia General Assembly in Wilkes County were not cleared 
during his lifetime. So they remained in the temple. Now the question of slavery. Remember, born 1854, am I right? Moved to Georgia, 1783. And so about 29 years in there, uh, in Connecticut, uh, as a young boy, and then remained about half and half young boy and 10 years at Yale. So we know he wasn't a slave owner at Yale. Okay. And he, then he moved to Georgia, and he practiced law, and there is no record of him ever having been a commercial farmer. Uh, there is no record of him having ever owned a slave. And then the final commentary that I would add to that is there are at least three pieces of relevant information that uh, would indicate that he was personally very opposed to slavery. In fact, one of his speeches, he said that it was an abhorrent process. And there was a discussion during the Constitutional Convention about the prohibition of the importation of slaves. And it was a very divisive issue. And in, in one of the very few speeches he ever gave, he stood and said that he was personally opposed to slavery. But at that time, it was an integral part of society and business in the South. And that if the Constitutional Convention would leave it up to the good people of the South, that he believed that they themselves would prohibit it. And in fact, in 1798, now listen carefully, because there's a little, you gotta be careful here. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta dice the words. The state of Georgia outlawed the foreign import of slaves, the slave trade. Now, it doesn't say they outlawed slavery. It says they outlawed the foreign import of slaves. Uh, but to answer your question, there is no indication that he ever owned slaves, and there is even better, more direct indication that he thought personally that it was an abhorrent practice. And I would say that would probably be very consistent with his upbringing and, and, and background. Well, I just well, he got elected to office so several times, so he's getting elected primarily by slaveholders and pro-slavery people. I just wondered. If Absolutely, right. and, and Washington Wilkes County which was split as Wilkes County at that time, and it was split into Washington Wilkes. Washington Wilkes County was right in the heart of, of a part of the major part of the state where slave operation was very common. So, it, it, but there's no indication that he did. Well, wouldn't that Yale background have connected him at least to some kind of Presbyterian or? notions of uh, that were already beginning to play somewhat against slavery, yeah. at least in the North. Yeah. But it's interesting that he doesn't come out so hard on following that clear kind of, he, in other words, he seems to mix with the Enlightenment. He did. He, he, in fact, he was criticized by some for not being more forthright in his opposition, the public in his opposition to slavery. So. I don't know exactly what to make of that. I'm not a historian. I'm not a scholar of this. I'm an agriculturist and engineer. But I've studied it pretty in, in detail. And I think it is just another example of where pragmatism mm -hmm. led Baldwin to do things at times that were not necessarily perfectly aligned with his personal belief. But then there were other times, which we talked about earlier today, where he drove a nail in the, he drove a spike in the ground and said, absolutely not. And one of those was on separation of powers. Uh, we talked about the, the judges. He absolutely did not want the lines between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches blurred in any way. In fact, he, in one of his speeches, said that he thought it was entirely inappropriate might not be unconstitutional, but he thought it was entirely inappropriate for the president to send over to Congress a bill that he wanted passed. That that was not the executive branch's responsibility. He should stay out of it. Other questions? Well, I, I thought it was interesting that you said uh, in the 
quote you have that the uh, slightly disparaging comment about nature, following nature, and that students should more likely uh, spend their time living up to their moral uh, teaching. Is this, uh, and of course Jefferson has often friends, so is this uh, a slap at those kind of more romantic, more pro uh, mob? French ideas. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I'm not certain. I can tell you this, that um, there, there were a number of issues that were obviously internal conflicts to Bob. He, he wanted a strong federal government. But he feared too strong a federal government because having a, 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 a bound and successful union of states was very important to him. But he greatly feared that the central government would become too large and infringe upon not only states' rights, but individual rights. He was very much a states' rights person. And, uh, there was conflict there. He started out kind of being Hamiltonian and he wound up being kind of Jeffersonian. You know, you can see him evolve in his thinking as the modern politics speak. But there are other things that like that. He was a, he was a firm believer in, uh, he published, there's a document in the UGA archives where he listed five sort of discipline or topic, the things that he thought students ought to learn. And he was some, somewhat unforgiving in those. He thought this is, you know, mythology, literature, you know, mathematics, et cetera, et cetera. But then he also got over into the softer side and said students need the opportunity to explore and observe and find their passion in life. And so I don't know. I guess maybe he was a Renaissance man. I don't know. Well, <laughs> that, well, makes him, it kind of makes him a great founder and that he avoids these extremes of the Jeffersonians who would take us down the path of the French Revolution, which was an absolute disaster, where you embrace anything and everything, and you have no controls on society, versus Hamilton, who would lock us into this, basically return us to the British <laughs> model. That was what, Ham that was what, Ham or that was what uh, Jefferson told Adams when he said, he said, Hamilton would have us British in our customs, British in our clothing, British, John. Everything was British. And so I think that's what's good about Baldwin. He represents that middle path that, that we had to have, with avoiding these extremes. And he did that on the Grand Committee. Yeah. He was a highly educated man, you know, a Yale degree, a seminary degree, a law degree, and son of a blacksmith. Yet he always sided with the farmer, the common man. He thought he was very firmly and firm in his belief that education should not be limited to the upper class, that, that it was in the interest of the nation and society for everyone to be educated. And if you think about it, now I came from a land grant background, you know, I've spent almost my entire professional career at a land grant institution. But Baldwin's ideas about responsibility for public education were a hundred years before the Marl Act and Hatch Act. A hundred years before the concept of the land grant institution, and uh, I, I think I really appreciate that he made the comment to a couple of quotes that he made along his career. One that he I only know that he made one time was in a speech where he said to the uh, legislature in Georgia, "Agriculture is the only profitable business in this state, and as far as I can see, may may." be ever the only profitable business in this state. And, and we need support. The other one that he made, which he made repeatedly, this was like his little favorite thing, was, and I'll get it almost dead right, you, know, you look it up, but it was, take hold of the wagon so as not to let it run away. Because the odds of it running too fast exceed the odds of it running too slow. And he took that approach in, in his statesmanship. He wanted everything to be done at a very thoughtful pace. Uh, 
uh, because he said that, you know, that, that haste may waste and that we had been very deliberative in creating a constitution that could pave the way for a successful nation and that it had been done very deliberately by deliberate people and that uh, we should not be hasty about passing laws and, and, and making changes uh, just because we thought they were the timely thing to do. So, pretty good advice, I thought. Can you ask a question? Why, do you, why did you go into seminary for? And then you said again and again, theology, religion and uh, played an important part in public education. Right. Why do you think he thought such highly of theology or religion? What? And then what do you think that's that? And to do that's such an important factor back then, how do you think that factors in today, given the state, I think to say this, there were yeah. college, uh, college, you know, what's going on? Higher education. Yeah. Okay, so the question is why was the Baldwin so committed to religious study and what happened? Okay, well, his mother, uh, Dudley, Mary Dudley, uh, many members of her family were clergymen. Uh, he came from, and his father's family uh, was very religious. So he, he was raised in a very religious uh, family on both sides. you got to remember at that time that, that Yale was a college, but it was probably more a seminary than anything else. And so he undertook his regular studies, as he called them first, knowing that he would stay and do his seminary work in anticipation of being a preacher, a minister. And uh, the army came along, and he, he, he did that. And then during the course of his work as a chaplain, of course, he studied law and he did other things. So I kind of, I mean, I'm guessing, I, I, have no divine prophecy here. My guess is, is that early in life his intention probably was to, to, to be in the clerk, to be a minister. And because of the things that were happening in the country at the time, he became interested in, in other things and government and public service and whatever. But anyway, uh, so, so what impact did that have? I mean, how does that affect us today? I mean, again, Baldwin firmly believed based on his writings and speeches and what have you, that <laughs> civitas, it's on the board there, that, that, that a good society was rooted in morals, and he believed that morals were related to religion and education. So it's kind of the trifectorate of a good society is a, is a moral and just society, an educated society, and a, and a society that has some belief in something greater than themselves. And so he, he was a firm believer in that. He insisted on that in all of his arguments for education. And uh, so have we exactly followed that? Uh, well, unfortunately, no. Uh, in fact, the state of Georgia ceased following his model before it ever got out of the blocks. Uh, what we didn't tell you, and I don't want to prolong it, but I can talk to you afterwards, was that Baldwin's vision for public education in Georgia was not limited to having a University of Georgia. He wanted a vertically integrated education system throughout the state. He wanted the local schools and libraries to be under the auspices of the university so as to pull students through and push teachers back, he wanted a fully integrated system. It didn't happen. It still hasn't happened. I contend, I have told the last three governors, it's unimaginable to me that we spend as much money in the state of Georgia as we do on education, and we have no comprehensive strategy it's do this, do that, do this, do that, du duplicate this, replicate that, waste this. And we spend more money every year on education in the state, and every passing year we get a worse outcome. It's just unfathomable. So we, we started not following Baldwin's uh, recipe 
immediately after he wrote it down, and we haven't been following it since. And so I, I think, uh, frankly, the departure, and, and, and I, I won't limit it just to religion. How about virtue? Vir virtue, civics, civility, uh, service. Uh, one of my favorite little quotes, I told him about this book that I've been writing, it's been my observation over the years that the most difficult people in the world to work with are the people who fit this description. They would rather be a large part of something very small than be a small part of something very large. You ever work with those kind of folks? And they just don't want to be part of the team. They don't want to share the credit. They don't want to make an insignificant and unobservable contribution to something grand. And that's kind of what Baldwin did. I mean, we're 300 years beyond when his impact was. And still, I guarantee you I can walk the streets of Georgia and ask highly educated people, who was Abraham Baldwin? There won't be one out of 100 who can tell me who he was. So I, I think we have kind of lost, lost our way. And it's not just about religion. It's about service, virtue, civility, Tolerance, uh, all of those things that we know are good, uh, but somehow we've left them. Uh, and, and I'm not quite sure why we've done it, uh, but as I tell the parents, tell the parents at graduation every semester, and I haven't had one yet come back and tell me we failed. I'm sure we have in some circumstances. But our institution makes a commitment when your student starts that our commitment goes beyond the degree. We believe we have an obligation to prepare a graduate who can be a productive, contributing member of the community in which they live and work. That doesn't mean they necessarily will be, but they could be should they so choose. And I think that's, I think it's missing in a lot of what we do. We touched on uh, Baldwin's view on inclusion with his uh, influence in Georgia and their policy making, as well as the pride that he puts in education. And you know, we've talked about the connection between education, morality, and the way that affects the state. Uh, how could we tie in Baldwin's experiences or his life with the discussion on uh, reducing costs to college or attempting to make free college, uh, any of the legislative acts that seek to make it more available and more inclusive for students. Okay. All right. Here we go. Good question. I'm not just an administrator here to answer oh, that. Okay. I don't answer that. Someone who's been on the dark side of education for quite a few years. Uh, okay. So let me first say, and you may turn off and not listen to I believe that free college education for everyone is the worst idea possible. I think it's a horrible idea. Because there's a principle in economics, do we have an economist in the room? There's a principle in economics that the value of a commodity ultimately approaches what one pays for it. And education is a commodity. The definition of a commodity is something that's available in finite supply and for which you must pay to Daniel. The, the laws of, mar of supply and demand regulate market. So, I'm not a proponent of free education, but I'm also not a proponent of what we have now, which is too costly education. So one of the reasons we have too costly education, in my view, is because we, through government intervention, have created a false market. We said everybody must go to college. And we made federal money available for students to go. The amount of student debt in this country exceeds the amount of home debt that existed in 2008 when the, when the housing market fell apart. The amount of college debt is just unfathomable. So why is the cost of attendance going up for you folks? It's 
going up for two reasons. It's going up because we created a false market for it. And we created cheap, and I know student loan interest is not cheap, but we did create cheap money. And when we did so, guess what happened? Public commitment to funding higher education went down and the burden of education fell on the backs of the students and parents. So the cost of attendance to you as a student and your parents has gone up astronomically over the past 20 years. 10 times the rate of inflation. 10 times on average nationwide the rate of inflation. And uh, that's not good. That, that is absolutely not good. And uh, I believe it's frankly because education market being us got greedy we got greedy we said the money's out there the students can borrow it and by gosh we'll, we'll take it and uh, so if you look at the cost of attendance yeah it's gone up so how do you fix it uh, how do you fix it and uh, you know there, there are those who believe we can achieve it through efficiency I don't believe I, I, I think it's something that we need to do at the margins. We have a major cost problem. So we, we, need, to, we need to really decide what is, the, what is the base level of education that we want to provide public access to. Whether it be technical education or knowledge-based education. Uh, we're, we're losing a skilled workforce in this country rapidly. Uh, we're losing the work ethic among non-college graduates. And we're producing, I'll give you an example. Uh, I can get on my soapbox here. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I, I am an analyst. Uh, I'm an agriculturalist and industrial engineer by training. I have a minor in statistics from Texas a and I love playing numbers. So uh, about uh, a year ago, I accessed the numbers from the University System of Georgia. 29 institutions at the time. Five years worth of data on credential awards. So bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, doctoral degrees, you know, all sorts. By Carnegie Code, by discipline. And I've analyzed all that data. And I kind of wonder where we're going. Because the largest industry in the state of Georgia is what? Anybody know? Same as it is in Oklahoma, I think. Agriculture. Largest industry in the state has been since James Overbrook landed in Savannah. Okay. And as Abraham Mullen said, ain't likely to change. Okay. Largest industry in the state, 20% of our employment is in agriculture. So I thought, well, okay, what are we doing in higher education to supply the human capital needs of the state's largest industry? So I did this analysis. There are three public institutions in the state of Georgia that award bachelor's degrees or above in agriculture. Ours, the University of Georgia, and Fort Valley State University. In FY16, the three the entire university system of a quarter of a million students graduated 384 individuals with bachelor's degrees in fields that could be in any way related to agriculture. I mean that I was liberal in, in the way I added them up. During the same year, we produced 700 and some odd almost exactly twice as many dance majors. We produced 3,500 psychology grads, another 3,500 sociology grads. I can't remember how many English. Um, and then an infinite array of people with studies degrees. Just studies, you know. Uh, I, I don't, even, don't, can't, don't even know what they all are, you know. And so I'm thinking, And for 30 consecutive years in the state, we've not had enough position graduates to fill the vacant positions in agricultural education. We import engineers. We import foresters. We import people with technology, computer, and manufacturing backgrounds. 
And so I, you know, I kind of throw out as just sort of an idea, is it time to have a conversation about how we spend our public education dollars? And what is the base level of education that we ought to provide everyone maybe at no cost? So, you know, we we'll give you this piece, and then this piece is yours. Make wise choices. You know? I got nothing against a psychology degree. I really don't. I have good friends that are psychology faculty members. But there are not a whole lot of jobs you can get in America with a BS in psychology or a BA in psychology. <coughs> you can't be in clinical practice. You can't. And so what are you going to do? So I think we do have to have a conversation. And I don't want to dictate to people, you know, I'm a firm believer in liberal, liberal education. I, I mean, liberal arts education is right there with agriculture. It's Jeffersonian, yeah. you know. But I think we do have to have a conversation because we have to figure out how we can provide opportunity for college education and for technical education to students at a price that doesn't put them in a 10 to 20 year debt retirement cycle for their college education. Uh, I'm a free market uh, capitalist, and I won't put caps on them. I, I don't think we need caps. I don't think that'll fix it. I, I, I don't think that's the fundamental problem. Uh, well, some will price themselves out of the market. What was the question? The question was, well, should we cap cap costs? And I don't have a problem with uh, constraining. You know, saying the cost shouldn't rise more than the cost of living index or something. I don't have a problem with, with some sort of constraint. But my view is, is that one of the major problems in the cost, rising cost of college education is, in fact, been the government, the federal government. Uh, so I don't have much confidence they're going to fix it. I, I more likely think they created the problem. And... Uh, I think there are other ways. Uh, the, 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 you know, market supply and demand will will bring this in, in balance. Uh, but it is your generation of students that are paying the price. There's no question about it. I've got, you know, I've got a 35 year old son who hmm, he's off the payroll. I don't worry about it. He's got two engineering degrees. He worked for John Deere. He worked for Briggs and Stratton. And he now owns his own business. And uh, he's learning, learning the ropes. He's learning about making payroll. He's learning about, uh, well, that nine to five job I had with John Deere as a design engineer wasn't so bad. You know, I'm working 78 hours a week now because I got to make my payroll and pay my employees health insurance. And uh, I've got, and I got a daughter that's an intensive care nurse. So they're off my payroll. My Son has no debt, no college debt. Uh, my daughter has a little bit, uh, not much. But she got a little bit, but she, you know, she changed my jersey and did those things. <laughs> so I, dad, believes in that. He's a consequence. So she has a little debt. I'm not going to let it sink her. But I know some of you are going to have insurmountable debt. I see it all the time. Other questions? That didn't have anything, that didn't have anything, that didn't have anything to do with Baldwin. But good, great questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought, let's get back to Baldwin a minute. Uh, this is minor, but you said he got a divinity degree at Yale? You said he got a bachelor's degree, then he, he stayed three more years and got a divinity degree, is that right? He got an AB in the first four years, right. and I can't determine what it was, I have right. no record. And then he stayed on for three, three additional years. years in theology. All right. And then he became a chaplain. A tutor. Well, he was a tutor. Uh, okay. I thought, but you said he didn't become an ordained minister? He, he was licensed to preach right. in the state of Connecticut. Okay. But he never took a church. Okay. He, he wasn't a pastor of a church. He was not. But did, did he designate what his uh, denomination was when he became a chaplain? If he did, I can find no record of it. Okay. Um, and I, again, I'm not a Baldwin scholar, uh, but I just feel as president of the institution that's named after him, 
ought to have more than a little bit of knowledge about him. But I can't, I can't find out. I, I've not seen anything that specifies uh, what denomination. Yeah, is, is there not? A, is there a good uh, biography that's been written of him? A book length biography? Is that your the book? My you? Merton. Uh, the book was uh, penned, uh, was written by a, a historian at the University of Georgia. He passed away before it was published, and a colleague of his, the, uh, the, I believe the University Press, owned the rights uh, to the book when the gentleman died, when Merton died. And a colleague in the history department uh, was given rights by the institution to complete the book and publish it. Uh, I will provide, uh, Aaron asked me to address some questions. And uh, so, you know, I've read this book, I don't know how many times. So I read it again and made my notes, and I will share those notes uh, with references. And I have a significant number of other references other than the Merton book, uh, because the Georgia Historical Society, you just go online, you can get actually most of it off the internet from the Georgia Historical Society, has a very significant collection of stuff on Baldwin. And the University of Georgia Special uh, library collection uh, has a wealth of other information. Uh, that that picture, which you can't see very well, uh, this, if you look in the top left-hand corner, it says Abraham Baldwin. Uh, that is the first page of Baldwin's actual annotated, edited copy of the Constitution, on which he wrote his notes. And that original document exists in the special collections at the University of Georgia. Uh, they did give me a few years ago the privilege of seeing it. Uh, they didn't let me touch it. <laughs> they just let they opened the cabinet very briefly and allowed me to see it. But it is uh, that's actually taken from Georgia Historical Society's website. So he actually multiple pages had his notes in the margin and, and written in. Anything else? Well, hey, I want to thank y'all for coming out tonight. Thank you for the good questions. Uh, Dr. Bridges will be here uh, for a few more minutes if you want to come out and talk with him. Other than that, thank you. Uh, please look at the website. Remember, uh, in the spring, we'll be having the presidential lecture series, which I'm pleased to announce the topic of, I can already tell you, Andrew Jackson. And the Hermitage will be our focus uh, in uh, March. In fact, we're hoping to do it on March 15th on Andrew Jackson's birthday. Uh, he said he was born in the storm. And so he was born on the Ides of March, the day Julius Caesar was assassinated. <laughs> There's one thing that characterized his life was that. So please feel free to, you know, let us know if you have any questions about that. That will be coming. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. It was a great diversion for me. I spend most of my time responding to legal questions and in, law, in, in court and lawsuits and raising money as a president and dealing with bureaucracy. So this has actually been very fun. I enjoy it.